Joshua chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn there with me. I want to minister uh, for a few minutes this evening. I, years ago, was uh, ministering for Richard Brooks and Anita when they were pastoring in Brashoff, Romania. They took me out to uh, Dracula's castle. This is a uh, structure whereby they controlled a passageway, main thoroughfare uh, through the Black Forest into Germany. And uh, uh, heard the, uh, the legend of uh, uh, Dracula or Vladimir the Impaler. Cheerful fellow. <laughs> when people were miscreants, he had a habit of impaling them, leaving them impaled on the side of the trail or highway as a warning <clears throat> of what would happen to them when they misbehaved. The legend says that there was a golden cup that was left at a very verdant spring. And this golden cup worth a fortune to an individual in those days. And uh, no one ever took that because Vladimir was still in power. One day, uh, someone went to that spring to get a drink. And as they went to that spring, the golden cup was gone. And they said, Vladimir is dead. Now... There's a point that I want to make tonight because my spirit is not like Vladimir's. But for a number of years, I've been hearing the jingle when Pastor Mitchell is dead. When Pastor Mitchell is dead, uh, then we can deal with problem people. When Pastor Mitchell is dead, then we can go in a new direction. When Pastor Mitchell is dead, then we can have new headship. When Pastor Mitchell is dead, then we can be released to a wonderful uh, new era. You know the story of Mark Twain? He read his obituary in the newspaper and uh, he notified them and he said, uh, the news of the demise uh, of Mark Twain is greatly premature. I want to preach you tonight and when Pastor Mitchell is dead. <laughs> Here is a historical lesson. If you would follow there with me, Joshua, uh, Judges rather, chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, verse 6. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel... Uh, uh, the children of Israel went each one to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. You might read that again if you're waiting for my demise. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Heres uh, in the mountains of Gaash. And when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them uh, who did not know the Lord uh, nor the work uh, that he had done for Israel. I want to talk to you for a minute about the work that God uh, has done. Here we have the summation, if you want to read, read Joshua and Judges. One leader who followed the will of God has a history of making impact for the purposes of God. You remember that Joshua and Caleb went up and out of all the people that surveyed the land, it said that Joshua had another spirit. So here we have a principle, and this principle is that one leader, one man who will do the will of God is able to lead the people of God into the destiny 
that God had for them. I was preaching in uh, the Walthamstow Conference uh, last November. As I was preaching there, I had related in a sermon uh, the sensitive uh, areas of how our fellowship came into being, and I related that this was not some fantastic project that God had laid before me and said, Pastor, if you will do the will of God... On January the 10th, 2009, you'll be speaking to over 2,000 people in 1,600 churches represented in the world. Not at all. These were very small, insignificant decisions that were made about how I was going to structure what God was doing. Very insignificant. You would never believe that those small decisions uh, were absolutely essential to what we are today. It had to do with decisions I made uh, which decided what I was going to do uh, in circumstances there, having no idea how those were going to play out. As we were going to have a bite to eat after that, uh, uh, Pastor Brown was uh, uncommonly sober. And he related to me on the way... uh, that he was stunned with those insignificant decisions and the awesome fear that was put in his heart of missing the will of God. Now here we have the work of God. You know the story, Jordan opens before them, they walk through. They go into the area of the city of Jericho. They obey God. God kicks the walls over by an angel, defeats that city. They're fighting in the valley of Ajala. The sun and the moon stand still. So here's the record in the Bible of the tremendous work that God has done in the history of Joshua. And it's noteworthy that we pay attention to the words here because God had said to Joshua in Joshua 1.12, Every place the sole of your feet shall touch, I've given you for an inheritance. Now in Joshua 2 verse 6 says these words, And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each one to his own inheritance to possess the land. You see, this fellowship is a work of God. No one understands that more than me and some of the people that have been associated for a long time understand that our fellowship is a work of God. And as far as I know, it is unique in its impact and in its, uh, in its dimensions. As they went to obey this, God went before them and gave them a conquest of the land. As far as I know, the methods and the impact that we're making is unique in anything that I've been involved in or that I have observed. What we're dealing with is the grace of God in restoration. This isn't some razzle-dazzle, out-of-the-box, new, wow thing. No, no. What we are involved in is a restoration of the directions of God for the principles in the Word of God of restoration of His purpose and His Word in making disciples and sending them into the world. Listen to Isaiah 58, 11, 12. The Lord will guide you continually. God gave me this by an evangelist many, many, many years ago. And satisfy your soul in drought, uh, and strengthen your bones. Uh, you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. Uh, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, uh, and you shall be called the repair of the breach, uh, the restorer of streets uh, to dwell in. 
Not some new bizarre uh, doctrine, some uh, razzle-dazzle, not some flavor of the month charismatic movement, uh, but a restoration uh, of the foundational truths uh, of making disciples uh, and practicing discipleship uh, as we express that. uh, And we have an evident uh, grace of God uh, and favor upon our fellowship. 127 of Psalms, uh, unless the Lord be builds the house, uh, they labor in vain that build it. Uh, unless the Lord guards the city, uh, the watchman stays awake uh, in vain. Mike Rush is a wonderful member of our congregation. He and his wife are faithful folks, work behind the scenes. He was sharing with Greg uh, this uh, word. He said in 1990, when a group of men uh, rose up and ripped off a, a, a segment of churches, uh, Uh, We had 590 churches, and I'm not sure how many all involved, but we lost about 85 churches uh, in that period of time. He said we had 590 churches. Before this night is over, we will have represented uh, in over 100 nations of the world uh, some 1,600 churches uh, around the world. Can you say amen? Now that has to be a work of God. 39 years, that has to be a work of God. That cannot be a work of man. Here's Joshua, one man obeyed God and God powerfully moved the people to the destiny and this is phenomenal. I wanna tell you in our fellowship there are no high flyers. And our fellowship is built of common people, just like you and I, common people working at jobs. Uh, Many of them have come out of uh, uh, lifestyles of disaster, uh, the dregs of the street, some of them, uh, but us others just common people uh, that have served God uh, in our churches. Listen to this quote uh, by G.K. Chesterton. He said it well. The greatest political storm flutters only a fringe of humanity. In other words, he said the greatest political storm, they go, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a fringe of humanity. But he says these words, an ordinary man and an ordinary woman and their ordinary children literally alter the destiny of nations. Fasten your mind upon this for a moment as we're here. Because at the end of the day, I want you to know that we will be the first to confess uh, that this is a marvelous thing that God has done. Back in the book of Numbers 23, 22, 23, and 24, that old false prophet Balaam. When he's wanting to curse the people of God, he can't do it. He try. He's a famous cursor in all the land. He's hired to curse the people of God, but God comes down, gets a hold of his tongue and of his mouth, and he has to say these words, it shall be said of this people, what has God wrought, or look what God has done. That's what we have to say tonight, can you say amen? Thanks be unto God. This is a work of God, it is not a work of man. But we have to look carefully at the dynamics that God has used. The principle and the dynamic that is so powerful in our fellowship is the local church. We have been given a revelation of the potential and the dignity of the local church and from out of one congregation, you can touch the world for God. Think about that for a moment. I've had people that come to to Prescott, Arizona, and they're looking for this mega city. They're looking for the uh, the underground uh, trains. They're looking for all, and they say, this is it. <laughs> Thirteen thousand five hundred people. My wife came here in 1970, and from this little church, 29 people. The first service that we had, including seven of my own family, God has touched the world. God has touched the world. This is called vision in the Bible. 
This is not automatic. God is looking for a church and a people that he can use. He wants to put upon that people the destiny that he has ordained that from a local church they can, if they will obey God, if they will be stewards of God's people and stewards of God's money, they can touch the world and make an impact, as G.K. Chesterton said. Now, what is in this story that we have before us? I want to embrace uh, this story of Joshua that just a segment of it is mentioned in Judges uh, chapter 2. What happened there is these people were released uh, to their destiny. Listen to it again. Judges 2 verse 6. And when Joshua had dismissed uh, the children of Israel, when each one... uh, to his own inheritance uh, to possess uh, the land. Wherever the sole of your foot shall touch, I have given you for an inheritance. Uh, They were released to pursue their destiny. That's very powerful. Most of you have no conclusion what I have just said. Uh, That's one of the dynamics uh, that has moved our fellowship to worldwide uh, expression. What we became involved in is releasing other churches as they begin to plant churches and they begin to grow to become conference centers. We released Tucson to become a conference center. We released uh, uh, El Paso to become a conference center. We released uh, uh, San Antonio to become a conference center. Released Chandler to become a conference center. Released Tempe to become a conference center. Well, you mean Chandler and Tempe? They're just over the hill, Pastor. If you do that, uh, think of all the people who won't come to your conference. Think of all the money that you won't get, Pastor. If you do that, you're going to lose. Listen, this is a dynamic uh, that has empowered our fellowship is releasing them to pursue their own destiny. We're not talking about going out and uh, planting independent churches no longer accountable to the fellowship, uh, but we're talking about a principle uh, that they're responsible to the fellowship at hold uh, and have released them. Uh, and this year we're releasing another one is Jacksonville, North Carolina to service that. This is the secret to the growth of our fellowship. It is not keeping it all into ourselves. It is releasing them. Listen, you wouldn't have a tent big enough for a building to hold the people that could come here, but it would become very narrow and very small compared to what we have now. I preach in many conferences. I have the privilege of preaching in many conferences around the world. And uh, this is just a, just a sprinkling of a tremendous impact that God is making around the world and the dynamic uh, of releasing the people to their destiny, giving them dignity, just like a local church has dignity, a local conference center has dignity, is the dynamic that has accomplished that, uh, and we try to tamper with that that to our own destruction. We put headship invested in pastors. See, we actually are a preaching fellowship and we put tremendous uh, dignity in pastors. We don't hire and fire our pastors uh, by popular vote. Some of you have no idea what I just said to uh, Huh? <laughs> You'd be astonished what goes on in a religious world. Uh, but I want to tell you that this is one of the powerful dynamics uh, is that we put dignity upon the pastor. Uh, and as we put dignity upon the pastor, uh, it uh, frees him uh, to find the mind of God, not the mind of the popular vote of the people. Uh, Because if he preaches the word of God, he's going to lose some kinds of people. They're not going to accept that. That is a dynamic that many of you have no understanding of. We have a financial interlinking. 
We teach our people to tithe. Our churches uh, are supported by the tithes of the people. Each uh, church that is planted ties back to the mother church. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, furnishes a resource to grow and to expand. There's a partnering together around the world of our fellowship financially that is unique as far as I know around the world. Uh, and uh, we are people uh, that have linked together uh, for world evangelism uh, and that is one of the powers and dynamics uh, of our fellowship. Uh, we focus on reaching down uh, and helping the weak uh, and the struggling uh, in a small work. Uh, listen to Acts 20 verse 35. I've shown you in every way uh, by laboring like this that you uh, must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, the reason that we have guerrilla teams isn't that we sat around one day and said, Now what can we do to keep these people from going and getting drunk? I know what we'll do. We'll have a program to keep them busy. The purpose of our guerrilla teams, our impact teams, some people became nervous about the militancy. They were afraid we might be known as a cult of some kind. Don't call it guerrilla teams. Uh, call it impact teams. Uh, they became so nervous about that. The purpose of that uh, was to reach out and help uh, struggling churches uh, that, helped, uh, that needed help uh, and in that principle is a non-competitive spirit. Uh, ethics were built in uh, that when we would send out a music group uh, or an impact team, uh, they would not be proselyted. Uh, and next week we say, what's happened to our guitars? Oh, don't you know he joined uh, that church there. We needed him down there. Ethics uh, were involved uh, and we reached down uh, to help uh, the needy. Most of you have no idea what that's all about. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each, listen, let each esteem others better than himself. Uh, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, uh, but also uh, for the interests uh, of others. That's why we started uh, Guerrilla Teams, is to help a struggling pastor or new church. Uh, and that principle is involved uh, in that very thing. I was a member of a denomination for 25 years. As a member of that denomination, I went to Bible conferences. Nothing ever said that would ever help me or even relate to where I was. I was from nowhere's will. As a matter of fact, Arizona, New Mexico was despised as something that was not even worth focusing their attention on. The high flyers rose. No one would ever help you. No one would have the time of day, whether you lived or whether you died. My wife wife and I uh, paid our own way to conference after conference uh, and to convention after convention uh, and no one ever reached out to help us. No one ever paid attention to us uh, and that's why I have a heart for the little struggling pastor. Got a pastor wife called me and said, Pastor, you can scratch our name off the conference we're not able to come. I said, why? I said, well, we, we can't afford it. I said, nobody sets that standard. We, we don't even keep records here of who gives what. We don't know whether you sponsor your delegates or not. We depend on your uh, integrity. And if you don't have the money, we still want you in conference. I said, call your husband, get your butt in a car and get over here. I'll take care of you. This is the spirit that is in our conversation. Why do you do that, Pastor? Why do you do that?
because they're struggling little pastors. Uh, they don't know the way sometimes. They can't afford to do what needs to be done. Uh, unless somebody reaches out and helps them, they never will rise. Uh, and I struggled in my wife for a year. No one cared. No one even knew we existed. And that's why we built this principle into our fellowship. I want to talk to you quickly about the challenge uh, that we face as a fellowship. That challenge is that this heritage is to be retained. Every generation feels it has the right to change the structure and to change the principal reference points. And nonconformity has been elevated to a sacred element in our generation. Something sacred has been laid into your hands. Most of you, as I say, you have no reference points outside of our fellowship. You have no idea what I'm saying in its full impact. Uh, but I want to tell you something sacred uh, has been left into your hands. Uh, and the ver- value of heritage uh, lies with stability. Judge, uh, jo- uh, 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 Jeremiah 6.16, listen to this. Stand in the ways and see... And ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. You see, the new and the fresh isn't always true. We're not saying you should not be innovative. We're not saying you should never sing new courses or any of those kinds of things. But sometimes out of the box is out of your mind. You need to be open. You need to be adaptable. But I'm talking about principles, uh, and these principles are profound. They're very crucial. And when you're innovating, make sure that you do not violate and throw the baby out with the bathwater when you're trying to innovate uh, and trying to relate. God didn't call us uh, to relate. He calls us to preach the gospel. Most importantly, as I conclude, God must be a reality in all that you do. You must know him and you must experience him. Very easy to fall into religious activity, religious calisthenics, religious phraseology. I'm talking about the Lord. God must be experienced. And in Judges 2.10, listen to this tragic note. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them which did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Here's a tragic note. Obviously, there was a breakdown in the transmittal of the spirit that Joshua had. Joshua had another spirit. I have just related to you several principles that have to do with what God led us to become and begin to reveal, and that is an essence and an outflow of a spirit. The blessing of our conferences is not the sermon content necessarily, which is always very, very good. The blessing of our conferences uh, lie within that principle uh, is in our conferences there is a spirit transmitted. There is a spirit conveyed, if you will, and that spirit uh, is what makes us what we are uh, and a spiritual dimension. Acts 20, verse 28. The Apostle Paul writes these words uh, to a group of pastors that came down uh, from uh, Ephesus. Now, in Joshua, they had either failed through ignoring or failed through neglect or failed through compromise of uh, settling for uh, the, uh, the move of the moment, something less than what Joshua had contended for, which was God genuinely to manifest himself and to move. Uh, And they had lost that, uh, and they were moving into new dimensions. Acts 20, verse 28. Paul writes these words. uh, He had called the pastors down from Ephesus. uh, 
as he'd called them down just last uh, a year ago, last uh, November, we were in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey. And as we were uh, in Turkey, we began to go to some of these biblical sites. Uh, we went to a place I'd never been to before, which is called Miletus. Uh, Paul speaks these words in Miletus. It is 30 miles south uh, by foot. Paul did not stop at Ephesus by uh, boat. He bypassed them uh, and landed at Miletus, which is a major center. I think the uh, arena, which is there still intact, holds some 6,000 people. Uh, he stopped there, called the pastors down from uh, Ephesus, and then spoke these words. Uh, Therefore... Take heed to yourselves uh, and to all the flock of God uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers uh, to shepherd uh, the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Something sacred uh, has been laid in your hands uh, and that has to do with the people of God. Think about this for a moment. We face a constant danger and that constant danger he mentions there, and he relates this in verses 29 and 30. For I know this, uh, that after my departing, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock, also from among yourselves. Uh, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples uh, after uh, themselves. Now this is very p potent as he speaks these words. Uh, because he's warning about two things uh, which are alive and well wherever you pastor today. Uh, as a congregation, you must be aware of this as a pastor. You as the doorkeeper to the flock, you who have oversight, uh, you're responsible for this flock which God has purchased with his own blood. Grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Catch this picture. See, there's something in nature that is very peculiar, and uh, there are predators uh, that will kill just for the sake of killing. When you have a dog that has learned to kill chickens, uh, you must kill them. They will kill chickens just for the joy of killing when you have a dog who begins to kill sheep, you must destroy him because a sheep-killing dog will never stop. He's a sheep-killing dog. He kills just for the taste of the blood, just for the joy of killing. Uh, many of you have uh, read uh, The Man-Eaters of Savo, uh, building the railroad in Africa, how these lions got a taste of human blood. And when they got a taste of this human blood, uh, then they became predators uh, that killed uh, for the joy of tasting human blood. They were addicted to it. Now when Paul says, grievous wolves uh, shall enter among you, he's not talking about uh, somebody, that, uh, a predator just came in to kill one sheep and carry him off. He's talking about uh, a bloodlust that would destroy the entire flock. Lock that on also. Men shall arise among you, among you, drawing away disciples uh, after themselves. In other words, what we have here is the people is not the priority any longer. Self-interest now has begun to rule. Uh, and uh, the difficulty is, obviously, these people would have had prominence in congregations in churches. Uh, and uh, their self-interest... Uh, would have begun to rule. They don't care for people. They don't care for God's kingdom. Self-interest rules, uh, and they're going to rule or ruin. If that spirit's on you, you do not have the spirit of Joshua. If that spirit is on you, you do not have my spirit. So let's look for a moment, uh, because here we have, uh, don't be satisfied with where you are, uh, Verse 31 says, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. There's a good note to this. Paul brings these leaders down and he leaves them a wonderful promise and a wonderful heritage. And he says in verse 32, So now, brethren, I commend you to God. We need God. Can you say amen? 
See, God is real. God's not just a religious principle. God's not just some kind of a movement. God uh, is real, and he moves by his Holy Spirit, uh, and he imparts a dimension of the authenticity uh, of the living God. He can heal. He can deliver. He can genuinely save. Uh, he can genuinely empower. Uh, he can genuinely move people to accomplish his will. Can you say amen tonight? God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up uh, and to give you an inheritance among all those uh, who are sanctified. I want to tell you this evening, you can have God actively at work in your life uh, to the end of your days. I believe that to the end of your days. I'm not looking for a rocking chair somewhere. I'm not looking for a place to retire to. Can you say amen? I'm looking to live out my days full of the Holy Ghost, full of the fire of evangelism with a vision for the souls of men around the world. And this is my heritage, and I walk in that heritage tonight. Here's a statement that triggered me. It was early last spring. A man said to me in his office, Pastor Mitchell, When you die, I'm going to have some hard decisions to make. When you die. (laughs) When you die, I'm going to have some hard... Why would you have some hard decisions to make? This is not a work of man. This is a work of God. Why would you have some hard decisions uh, to make? If you do what we do... It doesn't matter who's alive or who is dead. The work of God continues on. Can you say amen? God's workers are for a time frame. But God's work lives on. And if we fasten our hearts on that, it doesn't matter who's alive. It doesn't matter who's dead. The principles are the same. God will work in every generation.